Well, it's week seven of online church, and the longer this goes on, the more I hear people express how much they miss being in church and how they cannot wait to be able to gather together again. There's a lot of talk going on right now. In fact, the governor is addressing the state as we record this message, uh, revealing some of his plans and, and the things that are to come. There's a longing to go back to normal, or at least whatever the new normal will be, to open up things that have been closed. And so in preparation for the time that we will finally be able to gather together again, I want to start a new series. The new series is entitled Ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word. It's the Greek word in the New Testament that we translate to, to the word church. Now, uh, while there are other words in the Bible that describe the church, Ecclesia is the perfect word for this series. You see, ecclesia in Greek is a combination of two words, ek, which means out from, and kaleo, which means to call. It's, it's to be called out from, and it's not distinctly uh, used of the church. It's, it just means a group of people who are called out to gather, to assemble. In the classical Greek authors, they would use this to, to refer to political gatherings. Uh, uh, the New Testament even refers to, uh, uses ecclesia when it refers to secular gatherings. But, but it's definitely the word that we translate to church uh, quite often. Now, the funny thing about this word is it can mean uh, two different things. It, it, it can mean the, the called out of God, the, the church universal, all Christians everywhere. But very often and, and more often than not in the New Testament, it, it refers to a local gathering. It's the ecclesia, the Christians who are gathered together. You see, over the past seven weeks, we have been the ecclesia, the called out of God. We've been reaching our community. We've been caring for one another. But we haven't been the ecclesia, the gathered people. You see, when people express how much they miss church, they're not saying that they miss the church universal. We're missing the church gathered. You could read it in social media posts, that longing to be together. You hear it in conversations. Some have expressed uh, a recommitment to church. They've, they've confessed that, man, I, I made church attendance uh, such a low priority. I took it for granted. And then all of a sudden, when the option was taken away from me, I realized just how important it was. And people are saying, I'm, I'm recommitting. Some people have even posted and, and, and shared and uh, joked about, I miss church so much, I miss the people that I don't like. I miss the people that annoy me, the people that frustrate me, the people that step on my toes, the people who press my buttons. Now, I know that may not sound like such a great thing to admit, or it doesn't sound very polite to say, but you know what? I think that honest admission is actually a really beautiful thing. You see, while I'm excited that we, that we are all excited about returning to church, I want to make sure that when we come back, that we are prepared for reality. If our time away over these past seven weeks has led us to paint some sentimental utopian picture of the way the church is, uh, then, then I'm afraid we've set ourselves up for a rude awakening. Yes, let me say this again. I, um, the admission of saying, I even miss the people that I don't mix well with is a beautiful thing. In fact, let me... Let me let me take it up a notch and say this. Uh, I would be concerned if we at Radiant were some utopian church where we all naturally got along. I would be concerned if we all agreed on everything. I'd be concerned if we lived in perfect harmony. Now, I know what you must be thinking. Our pastor has lost his mind in quarantine. Aren't we supposed to get along and love one another? Aren't, doesn't Jesus say that the world would know that we are his followers, his disciples, by how we love one another? Aren't we all children of God and therefore we're brothers and sisters? Let me, let me say, yeah, yes, we are to love one another, but loving one another and getting along are not necessarily the same thing. And while we are indeed brothers and sisters in Christ, if you grew up with a brother or a sister, you know that you don't always get along. You see, I want us to be ready for reality that there is this ugly side to church. But more than just deal with it or know about it, I want us to embrace this ugly side. And I know that sounds strange to you, but stick with me. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 as we talk about embracing this ugly side of church. The book of Ephesians is a letter written by Paul to the church in Ephesus. Paul had a, a great relationship with the church in Ephesus. He had been through there a number of times, stayed for three years at one point. And as he's going back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, he calls the elders to meet him in a nearby town so he could say farewell because he knew that would be the last time he would see them. He writes this letter while imprisoned in Rome after he says his farewell in about AD 62. And the purpose is to give them instructions about here is the gospel message and here are the implications of that and how it uh, affects your life and how you live out your Christian life. So he speaks to the, the local ecclesia, the gathered church in the city of Ephesus. But at the same time, this letter serves as a, 
as an example for the ecclesia, the church at large, the church universal, what Paul teaches this local church applies to us today. So if you have uh, your Bibles, read with me in Ephesians chapter 2. Let me give you some context before we read our passage today. The, the passage that immediately proceeds what we're about to read, chapters 2, 1 through 10, uh, Paul lays out the good news. He lays out the gospel message of Jesus. He, he, he gives us some of our most treasured verses when it comes to explaining what we believe and what Jesus has done for us. Listen to this, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. But God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much. And even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is by it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. And then verses 8 through 10, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. So he lays out the gospel in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2. And then... He brings, us, he brings us to the implications of that gospel. Let's read chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promise that God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles no longer are strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling, where God lives by his spirit. So in verses, uh, verse 11, we see Paul reminding the Gentiles who he's addressing here that that the day and the Jews, they were once separated. The Gentiles were outsiders. The, the, the Jews were, they were, were spiritually proud, but shouldn't have been. And he goes on and says that we have been united in Christ, that, that they themselves, they had been united in Christ because of what Christ has done on the cross. They were once far from God, but because they are now united with Christ, they are now near. He goes on in verses 14 and 16 and says that on the cross, that Jews and Gentiles became one people. Two different groups now became one. He broke down the wall of his hostility that separated them. He created peace by creating these two groups into one. And then he reconciled both of them to God and to one another. You see, there is a, a unity that takes place that the gospel brings. Verses 19 through 22, he uses the imagery of this unity and describes this new group that takes place Jews and Gentiles are together as fellow citizens. They are members of the same family. They're members of God's family. They are his house, together his house, which Christ is the cornerstone. And a cornerstone is that first stone that's set and everything else that gets set is in relationship to that stone. Jesus is the cornerstone that we are carefully put together, Jews and Gentiles, to become the holy temple of God. And we are his dwelling place through the spirit. There is unity but not just a unity that's uh, uniformity. It's, it's not that at all. It's actually unity in diversity. See, the gospel brings unity in diversity. Jews and Gentiles had this long history of animosity towards one another. The one thing that they had in common, because they had nothing in common, was their bond in Christ. The bond in Christ is that one thing they had in common, and because of it, 
There was a, a love and a unity that existed that was unexpected, that, that, that nobody would have saw coming if it wasn't for Christ. These two groups should not have lived with love and unity, but for Christ. And when that happens, the world takes notice. It's so unexpected that people see it and they notice. See, one of my favorite quotes about the church comes from a New Testament scholar named D.A. Carson. You've heard me quote this before. The church is a band of natural born enemies who love each other for Christ's sake. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, the world will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. Jews and Gentiles loving one another, the world knows that you are my disciples. If Jesus asks us to love our enemy, then that's a big task. Think about what he's asking us to do to love one another. That's, that's a little more in reach. I mean, someone steps on my toes in church. Somebody gives me a cross-eyed look. I, it's still within reach. We, what we see in this passage is that people are united who shouldn't be united. People are united and then people take notice. And when people take notice, God is glorified, which leads us to the, to the purpose of this unity. Skip with me to, to chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10 says this. God's purpose in all of this, referring to everything that came ahead, verses chapters 2 into the first part of 3, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in, in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God's purpose in this is to declare to all people and to the host in heaven that he's in the business of reconciling us to himself and to one another. God gets the glory. Now, the, the passage I just read said that his wisdom in its rich variety is on display through the church. Your Bible may, may say something like the manifold wisdom of God. That Greek word for manifold is actually a word that was used by the classical Greek authors to describe the intricate beauty that is seen in, 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 in a woven tapestry, in, in an embroidered tapestry. It, it, it was used to describe the endless colors that, that exist with flowers. That's the manifold. That's the kind of uh, word that Paul uses to describe the wisdom of God that we as the church reveal. Now, this might be all great, and you're thinking, cool, this is, a, you know, I'm learning something here, but I did start this message talking about the ugly side of church, and you may be thinking, well, Jerome, wait a minute, what you're describing is a beautiful picture of church. What you're describing is, is love and unity and a witness to others, but, but where's this ugly side? Where, where does that come in? What were you getting at at the beginning of this message? You see, I said that the ugly side should be embraced, even celebrated, and you're probably waiting for me to get there. So here we are. Let's go back to that, that definition of a band of natural enemies. Well, when a band of natural born enemies are brought together, there's going to be some friction. There's going to be some disagreement. There's going to be some clashing. There's going to be some stepping on each other's toes. There will be disagreement and there may be some hurt and pain. While we have indeed been granted the righteousness of Christ when we put our faith in him, it doesn't mean we necessarily suddenly have a righteousness of our own. We are still being transformed into the image of Jesus. We are still being transformed and we still have an, a, a sin issue that we deal with. We, we have not arrived. Christ's righteousness was given to us, not just so we can begin the Christian journey, but his, his righteousness is given to us every single day that we live, that my righteousness is not my own, but it's his given to me. Now, if you've been in church long enough, you know that we as Christians still act selfish. We still are greedy. We're still jealous. We're still judgmental. One of my friends um, this week, we were having a conversation and she sent me a text that said, people are going to people. People are going to people. Yeah, there's an ugly side to church, but it shouldn't surprise us and it shouldn't cause us to lose heart. In fact, if we embrace that reality of that ugly side, the possibility and the potential for, for friction and recognize that God uses it for our own good, the ugly side becomes an opportunity. It becomes an opportunity for us to love one another for Christ's sake, to walk in love. See, your old self, which before Christ is dead, and your old self doesn't want to walk in love, but now that you have a new life, the resurrected life, you can live out that new life, reflecting who Jesus is, walking in love as Christ lives through you. You can live out your new identity and begin 
to, to see these conflicts as opportunities to reflect his image and to bring him glory. Now, I realize this is easier said than done and that we will, um, I could preach it and you'd be like, yeah, okay, but listen, we're gonna dive into this next week. We're gonna dive into this in the coming weeks and make this a little more concrete. But for now, let me just give you the big idea for today that comes from this passage that sets up our entire series. And it's this, the ugly side of church is, is opportunity for your growth and God's glory. Let me say that again. The ugly side of church is opportunity for your growth and God's glory. I must admit that when I was trying to craft this big idea, one of my original drafts had the word fertile soil, that the ugly side of church is um, fertile soil for your growth, because growth, fertile soil. But then I realized where fertile soil comes from and what's in fertile soil, what makes up fertile soil. And um, I decided that I wouldn't go there since I'm no longer a, a youth pastor, but I'm a senior pastor now. I'll let you, I'll let you work out those details. So we're gonna stick with the ugly side of church as an opportunity for your growth and God's glory. So what does that mean? What does that mean today? How, how, how can I embrace that ugly side as an opportunity? Well, let me, let me give you a couple of things. First of all, work to reframe how you see the ugly side of church. When you see people stepping on toes, when your toes are stepped on, when you see potential disagreement or potential conflict, instead of finding yourself annoyed or lamenting or declaring, isn't that a shame? Be amazed that God would choose us to reveal his glory to the world and to the heavenly host, that God would choose us in his plan. Be amazed more than annoyed. Reframe that thing. People are going to people, and guess what? <laughs> you're part of the people. <laughs> if you remember your potential to be the people who will people, who will act like people, it helps us reframe this. And when we can reframe, we can respond correctly in a God-honoring way, in a Christ-like way that's not natural to us what we love for Christ's sake. The second thing I would say is to help others reframe. The truth is that the ugly side of church has caused many to become disillusioned and withdraw from community. Many who have given up and walked away from faith because they've seen this and said, how can Christians act this way? But as far as I'm concerned, Christians are expected to act this way because we are sinners who are saved. I think this way, the ugly side, is the first part of telling the gospel story. Look at us. We can't save ourselves. Look at us. But then look at Jesus, who is righteous and holy, and took our place. Help people reframe it. Now, I'll be honest, there are, Christ there are, there are non-Christians who, who look at the ugly side of church and they've heard it and they, and that might be the one obstacle that they keep throwing out there. Like, yeah, I, I think I like this Jesus thing. I think I, I, I believe, but I don't know that I want to get involved in that. I like Jesus, but I'm not so sure I like the church. Help them reframe it and say, no, that's part of the gospel message. There, are, there is ugliness because we are in transition. We are being shaped and formed, but we were never good enough in the first place. And that's why we need Jesus. In fact, if, if you are um, one of those people who has become disillusioned, who has found themselves withdrawing from community, community, my challenge to you would be to re-engage. If you're a Christian who's been hurt, and as a result, you've been practicing social distancing before social distancing was even a thing that you knew, just a, another kind of social distancing within the church, you've been present but not present, then re-engage. Listen, the idea of self-preservation through holding people at arm's length and playing it safe is not really playing it safe if it means you're holding God's plan for your growth and his glory at arm's length. Re-engage. Be part of the community. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. And if you uh, are here today, perhaps I described you just a few minutes ago when I said, people who are checking out faith, who are on a journey, uh, but are not so sure because of this potential for the ugly side of church. If that's the obstacle, can I, can I challenge you to do something that would seem strange for someone who hasn't necessarily professed faith? Why don't you trust God that he has you? If God has brought you this far, don't let this become the obstacle 
that prevents you from crossing the line of faith. Trust that he's got you. He has been working in your life leading up to this moment and he continues to work in your life and he will continue. He's got you. See, the message of Jesus, which has been throughout this whole sermon, is that we are born into sin and that Jesus, God in the flesh, comes and lives a life that we could not live and dies a death that we deserve in our place so that we may be reconciled to God and we could be in right standing and right relationship. He promises life, not just life eternal, but an abundant life today as we find a new life in Him. All you need to do is confess and believe. Believe and confess. Cross that line of faith. You can do it right now on your couch. You can do it in your car this afternoon as you're driving. Just cross the line of faith. And if you do, I'd ask you to let us know. Reach out to us. We'd love to walk alongside you in this new journey. You see, uh, I think the most appropriate way to end this message, if we were gathered on a Sunday morning here in this building, would be to serve communion. And while we're not, we are going to serve communion. The ugly side of church is an opportunity for your growth and God's glory. And it's through communion that we say, listen, I'm remembering what Jesus has done and what he has done is he brought us together. You may recall a few weeks ago, I preached a message that said that we are in community together, not because we chose one another, because, but because God chose us and put us together. When we receive communion together, it's a corporate exercise. I mean, you can receive communion by yourself, but he gave it to the church to together say, we remember what Christ has done for us and in us. We're gonna embrace God's plan for the church. So what I'd like to do right now is just give you a few instructions because you should have received word by email and social media um, that we are gonna receive communion at the church through, with a drive-in style. I'm, I'm so thankful that our local government officials have allowed us to do that. And so we'll have some of our staff out on the sidewalk. Uh, when you drive into the church, we'd ask that you go to the south side of the parking lot so that when you come up to the curb, the, uh, the driver's side would face the sidewalk where the church is. And uh, we'll be there with a prepackaged communion wafer and uh, juice. We'll share a moment of prayer together and we'll send you on your way. And because we want to be good neighbors and uh, law-abiding citizens, we'd ask that you not get out of your car and visit. I know the urge will be great because, because there is a unity and there is a love because we have a bond in Christ. We'll have that moment soon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. For in your word, we, you reveal who you are and what you've done. As we reflect on what you have done, you've put us together as imperfect as we are with the issues that we still have. But, but it's through that that you are actually shaping us. We're growing into your image and you're using the church, even things that are what we would call the the ugly side of church, a tool in your hands for us to be shaped more and more in your image. Lord, as we continue on in the series, would you shape us and would you indeed receive glory? We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.